Desjardins brought the credit union idea to Canada and helped establish the first credit union in the United States. I have seen the bright concept of Estes Park come to beautiful fulfillment. I am happy to participate in dedicating Filene House, the international headquarters of the Credit Union National Association. And when we pass this bill, every American will have a right to join credit. <laughs> America's credit unions are said to have found their roots in Rochdale, England, when, in 1844, a small group of economically oppressed textile weavers united and formed the Rochdale Society of Equitable Pioneers. The society elected officers, sold shares, and opened a cooperative store that sold household goods to members at fair prices. These principles for cooperative business provided the fundamentals for the first financial cooperatives, or credit unions. Friedrich Wilhelm Reifeinsen and Hermann Schulz de Litsch are credited with establishing the first cooperative associations and lending societies in Germany. Their efforts led to Reifeinsen's forming the first truly cooperative credit society in 1864. The credit union movement crossed the Atlantic to Canada, where Alphonse Desjardins, a debate recorder for the Canadian House of Commons, helped create North America's first credit union, La Casse Populaire de Livy, the People's Bank of Livy, in 1900, and the North American Credit Union Law in 1906. In 1908, the movement migrated to the United States, where the textile workers of Manchester, New Hampshire, were being denied safe places to save money and access to reasonably priced credit. Concerned about his parishioners' well-being, Monsignor Pierre Evy of St. Marie's Parish called upon Alphonse Desjardins and established St. Mary's Cooperative Association, the nation's first credit union. Attorney Joseph Boivin volunteered as its first president and housed the association in his own home. Financial equality for all Americans had begun. It was in Boston where legislative action for the nation's credit unions first took place. Concerned with the growing problem of loan sharking, Pierre Jay, the state's first banking commissioner and a group of credit union activists, drafted and helped pass the Massachusetts Credit Union Act of 1909. One of the activists was Edward A. Feline, a multimillionaire who is credited with establishing the movement in the United States. In 1917, Feline organized the Massachusetts Credit Union Association and hired attorney Roy F. Bergengren as its manager in 1919. Less than a year later, Feline used more than a million dollars of his own money and organized the Credit Union National Extension Bureau. By 1930, the Bureau had assisted 32 states in passing credit union legislation and organized 1,100 credit unions. The most prolific organizer was Thomas W. Doig, who helped establish more than 1,000 credit unions during his career. During the 30s, as thousands of banks fell victim to the Great Depression, credit unions thrived. It was time for national legislation. And on June 26, 1934, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt signed the Federal Credit Union Act into law, establishing the Bureau of Federal Credit Unions. Less than two months later, on August 10, 1934, 52 delegates from 30 state leagues gathered at Estes Park, Colorado, and created the Credit Union National Association, or CUNA. At CUNA's first board meeting, it was agreed that insurance was as fundamental to the movement as savings and credit. With a $25,000 loan from Feline, CUNA Mutual was incorporated on May 20, 1935, to provide insurance to the nation's credit unions. In a building christened Raiffeisen House, they opened for business in Madison, Wisconsin. A year later, 
CUNA Supply Cooperative was created to provide credit unions with bookkeeping and promotional materials. The movement was well on its way when it suffered a great personal loss. In 1937, Edward Feline, the father of the United States credit union movement, passed away at the age of 77. During the 40s, International Credit Union Day was established, and CUNA Mutual was the fastest growing life insurance company in North America. During the 50s, CUNA, CUNA Mutual, and CUNA Supply built a new home, Feline House. President Harry S. Truman personally laid its cornerstone and dedicated the building on May 14, 1950 bringing further national attention to the credit union movement. In 1952, the movement began a major three-year national advertising campaign in the United States and Canada. Funded almost entirely by CUNA Mutual, millions heard newscasters Gabriel Heater and Lauren Green talk about credit unions. Ads were placed in Businessweek, Time, and Newsweek magazines. In the end, almost 6,000 new credit unions were organized. In 1954, CUNA established the World Extension Department, launching the international movement. And sadly, in 1955, pioneers Roy Bergengren and Thomas Doy both passed away. In the 60s, CUNA Mutual dedicated its new headquarters in memory of Roy Bergengren. The Credit Union Managers Society was organized to provide credit unions with networking and educational opportunities. And to help create a worldwide federation, CUNA International replaced the World Extension Department. During the 70s, the independent federal agency, the National Credit Union Administration, replaced the Bureau of Federal Credit Unions. The National Credit Union Share Insurance Fund was established giving the credit union movement its own fund outside the banking industry. With the successful development of credit union organizations throughout the world, the World Council of Credit Unions replaced CUNA International. U.S. Central Credit Union was chartered to provide investments, loans, and other products to credit unions. The Save Our Share Drafts campaign became the first national political action effort to fight bank attacks. And the Central Liquidity Facility was established by the NCUA as a lending resource for credit unions that experience unusual or unexpected liquidity shortfalls. On May 31, 1980, more than a thousand World Credit Union leaders gathered in Madison, Wisconsin for the dedication of the Credit Union Center, a new complex that would include the CUNA Mutual Group, CUNA and Affiliates, the World Council of Credit Unions, and the National Credit Union Foundation. And in 1984, the United States Post Office recognized the Federal Credit Union Act's 50th anniversary with a commemorative stamp. During the 90s, the credit union movement defended itself from the banking industry's constant attacks. In 1991, Operation Grassroots was organized, a massive lobbying campaign to thwart bankers' political efforts to challenge credit unions and to influence legislative issues. In 1996, the credit union campaign for consumer choice was created a lobbying and public relations effort designed to defend the credit union movement from banking industry attacks on credit unions' field of membership and tax-exempt status. The effort resulted in perhaps the most significant event of the credit union movement. On August 7, 1998, President Bill Clinton signed H.R. 1151, the Credit Union Membership Access Act, into law ensuring Americans the right to choose where they conduct their financial business. The credit union movement was poised stronger than ever as it entered the new millennium. 
In 2000, the Credit Union House on Capitol Hill was established as a visible presence in our nation's capital. And in the former home of Joseph Boivin and St. Mary's Cooperative Association, the New England Credit Union Heritage Foundation opened America's Credit Union Museum in Manchester, New Hampshire. Under its mission of preserving our nation's credit union heritage, the museum also serves credit unions from across the nation. From its very beginnings, the nation's credit union movement has overcome many hardships and obstacles. It has risen from economic oppression. It has beaten the evils of unfair lending practices. It has won its financial independence. And perhaps most importantly, it has ensured financial equality for all Americans, bettering the lives of countless millions. Not for profit, not for charity, but for service.